Good morning. Well, you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Amos. Amos chapter 1 will be there in a few moments. We have several of our members out of town for this holiday weekend, but all of you are here and we are very thankful for you. And we have several guests and we want you to know that we are thankful for your presence and your desire to worship our God. And we want you to feel welcomed and at home here at the Hickory Knoll Church of Christ, where we strive to be Christ-centered and Bible-based in everything that we say and do. But I'm hoping that each of you have had a good last couple of days. I know some have been off of work, and and yesterday, of course, was the 4th of July, uh, Independence Day. And and our family, we, we spent the last few days in Hot Springs. I told you last time that my parents had taken our kids up for 12 days, and I, I don't think they were ever going to bring them back. So we figured we have to go up there and get them. So we were there Thursday, Friday, and then yesterday morning, the weather was kind of rough and so we said well why don't we just start heading home and so we spent the 4th of July driving home from from Hot Springs Arkansas and and it was come about lunchtime and we were starting to figure out okay where we're going to eat and we had this place called Chili's in mind that a nice sit-down restaurant right on the on the 4th of July and I I said kids by the way uh, do you even do you know what the 4th of July is have you even ever heard of the declaration of independence. Of course, they said, no, no, we haven't. I said, all right, well, when we get to the restaurant and sit down, I'm going to read to you part of the Declaration of Independence. So we get out of the car and we get into the restaurant and we're sitting down. And of course, I'm in the patriotic mode. I'm wanting to instill a sense of understanding from father to children and have this teachable moment and going all right. And so I, I so we sat down. Now we ordered and I said, all right, the Declaration of Independence was written in 1776. And I had on my Google, I had found the, the script of it. And so I say, well, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And I, I'm starting to, to tear up a little bit. I'm telling you, I'm in the, in the moment. But my kids are just laughing and laughing and laughing. And I'm thinking... What's the deal on this? So I I continue that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of, and as soon as I was about to say happiness, they're laughing some more, and I look up, and Chili's on their TV has the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest. And there are two women, I'm telling you, that in the final seconds are trying to stuff down their 30th and 31st and 30th second hot dog and so this is going this is absolutely disgusting and so I, then all of a sudden they start calling the men out and the defendant champions and I, I, I'm trying to teach about life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and the American dream and these fellows and ladies in New York are their American dream looked a whole lot different than what ours did yesterday but it was so it was certainly a good day. I, I suppose ironically or coincidentally or perhaps even providentially, in the same year that our Declaration of Independence was written, in the year 1776, a very prominent English historian by the name of Edward Gibbon had written the classic study of Roman civilization, and he titled it The Decline of and fall of the Roman Empire, in which he observed all kinds of items, including how laws became oppressive, how morals had collapsed altogether, and how all of these things led to the fall of the Roman Empire. Another fellow by the name of Jim Nelson Black once wrote a book entitled When Nations Die. And this fellow was looking at how when there is social, economic, and moral decay, that there are nations that will not survive. And he came up with a list of ten characteristics of nations. And he's looking at the Romans, the Greeks, and, and all of these other civilizations. And on that list... He mentioned several items, including an increase in materialism, a rise in immorality, and also a decay of religious 
believe. And he noted that in his list of ten, if there was any nation that had three or four, then that nation didn't survive. And his punchline at the end of his book was that America had all ten of those characteristics and it's just a matter of time according to him. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with going back to the 1830s of the French diplomat Alexis de Tocqueville as he came over and he toured America trying to figure out what it was that that made America such a, a great place. And he says that I sought for the key to the greatness of America in her harbors, in her fertile fields and boundless forests, in her rich mines and vast world commerce, in her public school system and institutions of learning. I sought for it in her democratic Congress and in her matchless constitution. But Tocqueville says, not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Well, I know there's a lot of recent events in our country that have put us on alarm and have put uh, created a sense of, of disarray as we look at the, the moral and spiritual decay of our land. And most recently, with, with the big decision from the Supreme Court and, and others are, are suggesting that this, all of this is not really about the same-sex agenda as much as it is the agenda to take away all religious liberty from us as Americans. And that has us on edge, and that has us alarmed, and we are trying to figure out what is next and how we are going to proceed. And sometimes we proceed out of fear and and anger, and there are some valuable things that we can pay attention to in our world But, of course, there are valuable things that we need to pay attention to in our text this morning from the book of Amos. Our title of the lesson this morning is, When a Nation Will Rise No More. When a Nation Will Rise No More. I'm sure with God's people during the days of Amos, they thought that they would be a nation that would last forever. That they, because of, as one writer put their, that their business was booming and their boundaries were bulging, I'm sure they thought that nothing could ever stop them. But as Amos opens up in chapter 1, this is the 8th century before Christ. The Assyrians have yet to come in and to, to fully attack God's people. Notice, if you will, a string of verses pertaining to the sins of the peoples or the sins of the nations during this time. Amos is going to talk about all kinds of different groups and he's going to make his way to the people of Israel. In Amos chapter 1 verse number 3, the Bible says, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus and for four I will not turn away its punishment. Amos chapter 1, verse number 6, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Gaza, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Verse number 9, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Tyre, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Verse number 11, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Edom, And for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Verse number 13, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the people of Ammon, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Chapter 2, verse number 1, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Punishment. Chapter 2, verse number 4, Thus says the Lord, 
For three transgressions of Judah, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. In chapter 2, verse number 6, Amos now addresses the people of God in the northern kingdom of Israel. And he says, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pan after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor, and pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl to defy my holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge. And drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Verse number 13, Behold, I am weighed weighed down by you, as a cart is weighed down that is full of sheaves. Therefore, flight shall perish from the swift. The strong shall not strengthen his power. Nor shall the mighty deliver himself. He shall not stand who handles the bow. The swift of foot shall not deliver himself. Nor shall he who rides a horse deliver himself. The most courageous men of might shall flee naked in that day, says the Lord. All throughout history... Whether it was the Romans or the Greeks or the Persians, the Babylonians or Assyrians. Whether it was Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, Moab, Judah, or even the prestigious Israel itself. A nation's ability to be great was directly related to their ability to be good. With God, a nation will always stand tall. But without God, a nation will fall every single time. Why would we think America would be any exception? So what are we supposed to do? What is the solution when a nation is almost to the point where it will rise no more? By the way, in Amos chapter 5, verse number 1, things are getting a bit, a reality is starting to kick in. There is some lamenting going on. There is some grieving occurring in the house of Israel because, as verse number 2 says, the virgin of Israel has fallen. She will rise. No more. She lies forsaken on her land. There is no one to raise her up. A nation that will rise no more. That's what is the Israelites were dealing with. Because of the fact that they ceased doing good and being good. And because they were not following after God. Their nation was about to crumble. It was about to fall apart, never again to rise no more. But there is a breath of fresh air in the rest of Amos chapter 5. As Amos being a prophet of God, a man of God who is declaring truth to a wicked people. He is declaring and providing light in the time of national darkness. The man of God, Amos, was inspired by God, of course. And he is going to deliver to them a message of hope. But it is going to require their faithfulness and their repentance. In our text this morning in Amos 5, I'd like to make two observations of what it is that we can do when things seem as if they're going to fall all apart. We may be thinking of our nation or we may even be thinking of our own lives, how it may feel as if it is crumbling to the ground. But two observations this morning. First of all, from Amos 5, verses 4 through 9, 
What we are to do is, number one, is to make sure that we seek God. We've got to seek God. Amos says, well, verse number four, thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live. But do not seek Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor pass over to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live. Lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, with no one to quench it in Bethel. You who turn justice to wormwood and lay righteousness to rest in the earth. He made the Pleiades and Orion. He turns the shadow of death into morning and makes the day dark as night. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. He rains ruin upon the strong so that fury comes upon the fortress. Amos is calling the people to seek God, to stop seeking these pagan false gods and to to stop pursuing these things of the world and allow them to become more important. Rather to seek Him, seek God, seek Him and live. The Lord is His name. The Lord carrying with it the idea, of course, of sovereignty. The Lord is in charge. He is in control. And there is no other being or group that is more supreme than He. The Lord is His name. We are to seek Him and we shall live. I'm mindful of what Jesus himself says in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Hebrews 11, verse number 6. The inspired writer says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We have to, as an individual, as the Lord's people, as a nation, seek God. But secondly, this morning, as we continue in our text, verses 10 through 15, not only do we need to seek God, but we need to seek good as well. Verse number 10, the Bible says, They hate the one who rebukes in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. Therefore, because you treat down, tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. You afflict the just and take bribes. You divert the poor from justice at the gate. Therefore the prudent keep silent at that time, for it is an evil time. But seek good and not evil, that you may live. So the Lord of God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. We want to seek God, but we also want to seek good. You see, when our lives feel as if they're, they're crumbling to the ground, when our lives feel as if we will rise never again in the future, or even on a national level when we feel like this country can't get any 
worse. We may respond in fear. And if we're not careful, we may be trying to return evil for evil, hatred for hatred, anger for anger. But the scripture says here that we as the people of God are to hate evil and to seek good. Seek good and not evil. Hate evil and love good. Just because things aren't going as God intended, it doesn't mean that we as his people stop living the faithful, righteous, morally upright life. Just because things are not going well, it doesn't mean that we start mistreating others or or trying to manipulate or or to create hardship and and try to, to dish it back to them. But as people of God, we're bigger than that. And our hope is not dependent upon anything that is occurring in this world. But our hope is dependent upon our God, who the Lord is his name. And this Lord of Lord God of hosts will be with us. I'm mindful of what Romans chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 says. I I won't read all of those verses, but as far as the Lord rendering each according to his deeds, verse 7, eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good. Patient continuance in doing good. Also, Scripture says in 1 Peter 3, verses 10 through 12, that for he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and let his lips, his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and Pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. As we begin to close this morning, it is, of course, our prayer that America will never be known as just another nation who will rise again no more. Rather, it is our prayer that America will be great again. But if that be the case, America will need to once again to seek God and to seek good. But a word of caution as we're wrapping these items up is that we want to make sure that our American dreams do not entirely replace our heavenly dreams. It's one thing to be proud to be an American and to enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But it's a whole other thing to be proud to be a Christian and to enjoy eternal life, freedom from sins, and the pursuit of heaven. As we sang just a little while ago, this world is not our home. We are just a passing through. Our treasure is laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Quite frankly, from an eternal perspective, we are nothing more than resident aliens with our permanent home in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And as the Lord's church, we need to continue to be a a holy nation, as 1 Peter 2 says. The Lord's own special people proclaiming his praises by seeking him and seeking good. You see, it's one thing to be upset about what the earthly nations are doing, but we need to pay attention to this holy nation. And the scripture defines the holy nation is not America or any other country. The holy nation is the people of God. We are his elect. We are his special people. And God's people encompasses everyone and anyone who accepts Christ and lives a life of faith and obedience. 
We finish finally in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 35. Acts 10, verses 34 through 35. Peter, of course, is preaching and teaching to the household of Cornelius. Uh, One of the very first Gentile families to be converted to the Lord. And scripture says, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. In every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. As Christians today, we do not live in fear of losing religious liberty, and we do not live in fear about losing or are concerned about losing our faith over SCOTUS. Rather, we live in peace and in faith and hope and in joy and love, knowing that if we seek God and seek good, we will, regardless of what's happening on a national or international level, we will be accepted by Him in heaven for all of eternity. One thing's for sure, in eternity... God's holy nation, the church, will stand tall forever in heaven. But all nations and all peoples who have lived outside of Christ will be lost forever and certainly will rise no more. This morning we are singing this song of encouragement. And if you are ready to become a Christian, to experience this freedom in Christ, by putting your faith into action, believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins and confessing your faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if you this morning are ready to be baptized into Christ, to have all of your sins washed away, then we would love to help you to become a child of God. Or if you need to come back to the Lord this morning by repenting and turning and giving your life back to Him, will you come forward right now while together we stand and sing?